uh, uh, thank you, uh, Janet. Um, we have a series of vignettes today, uh, so you're going to hear from a bunch of different people. Uh, we have Chris Linder, who's in, uh, I think he's in Seattle. And then we have this crazy room full of people in Woods Hole that are all sitting around a table, and you'll get to see them on video in just a second. I think you might be able to see them now. Uh, each of them gets 10 minutes. If they go over 10 minutes, I'm going to cut off their microphone uh, because I have that power. Um, and we're going to start, uh, just right off the bat, we're going to start with Chris Linder, who you've received a couple of emails from. I'll let him uh, introduce himself in a little bit more detail, but uh, Chris is going to tell you a little bit about uh, science storytelling. And then we're just going to go in quick succession from that point on. Uh, for the speakers, I'm not going to break in in between you. So once we get, once Chris is done, let's all people just step in and start uh, giving your, doing your shot. If, uh, and I'll just keep track and make sure nobody's having any technical problems. Chris, uh, you can take it away. All right. Thanks a lot. Everybody hear me okay? Good. Okay. I'll take that as a yes. <coughs> Okay, so uh, my name is Chris Linder. I sent you guys an email last week. Um, I'm disappointed that I won't be able to join you this year. Um, so it's going to be up to you guys to tell the story of what happens this year on the Polaris Project. Um, so I just wanted to uh, basically motivate you today. Um, you all are going to be witnessing amazing things and uh, you're going to have uh, amazing experiences, and what you want to do is communicate those to the public. And, and the blog is the big tool for that. Um, it gets a lot of traffic, okay, and it's a, really, um, it's a really unique way that you guys can directly communicate with the public and get feedback as well. Um, so um, just some administrative stuff. I'm still missing about eight bio photos. They don't have to be really professional. You can do it with an iPhone. Just send them to me. Um, hopefully by tomorrow because I'm leaving for Greenland on Sunday and I won't, won't be working on this for the next month. So send me a photos of yourself. And the next thing is if you have not logged in to the, to the WordPress system yet and change your password, do that. Um, because you all have the same generic password at the moment. So go in there and change it. Okay, so when you get to the field, when you get to the, when you get to the barge, um, start thinking about different stories um, and, and try to, you know, the, the most important thing I think when you're, when you're phrasing these stories and when you're, when you're preparing things for the web, when you're writing for the web, just uh, you don't have to dumb it down necessarily the science, but uh, feel free to leave out the jargon, okay? So the first thing is to avoid the jargon and to just almost like you're writing an email back to friends or family back home, that is more or less how you should go about thinking about when you're writing your blog posts. Okay? Um, the other thing that's really critical is visuals. The web is a really visual environment, so stills, videos are going to be really critical. And so I was going to give you guys just a couple of pointers today in the like two minutes. Uh, the two minute photo talk, here goes. So, um, three things I will impart to you um, in the next three minutes. One is the photo you've got on the blackboard right now was taken at two or three in the morning. The, if you want to get light like this, which is good light, um, you're going to have to be out late at night and I encourage you all to, um, to explore um, you know, these, basically the different kinds of light you're going to find in the Arctic and it, it may require you to be uh, you know, to be uh, up late or up early in the morning to do that. Um, so that's the first thing. If the light in the Arctic is completely different, especially in the summer. And so um, learn how to use that to your advantage. Uh, the next thing, you'll see a picture of Karen here now. Um, people's faces are really important to see. Okay, it's really tough to shoot photographs of people with head nets on, which will be, and bug shirts, which will be very common. So when you get those days when it's windy or when the bugs are just down for some reason, um, that's when you want to be um, taking a lot of pictures. And try to get pictures of people doing stuff, actually doing science um, or interacting with each other or talking with some of the PIs or Zoom off or things like that. 
you know, take a lot of pictures and and have fun with it. But try to get people doing stuff. It's really um, it's really valuable. And uh, people tend to connect with people. They really make your story come alive. Okay, next uh, next image of mosquito. So this is just a uh, a reminder for me to remind you that details are really key. Okay, get in close. If you're if you're thinking that maybe your your pictures are lacking in some way, the, the most important thing you can do is step in a little bit closer, okay, and get a little bit tighter. And that will serve you in, in almost every photograph you take. Okay, so the last thing is free help. Okay, if you want some free help, this, this was the two minute version of a of like an hour long webinar I did for Apex. Okay, so there's the ad address. It's on Vimeo. If you just search like Chris Linder Apex webinar, you'll hit this Vimeo link. Okay, so this will, if you want instruction on how to take better pictures, this is an hour long thing you can watch. Um, it's online, it's free, it's on Vimeo. And um, that's about, about all I have. I am certainly, I'm totally available to help you guys, especially when you're in the field this summer. I'll be in Seattle probably the whole month of July, or at least part of it. So I encourage you, please, um, if you have questions about either photos, you know, getting stuff on the blog, anything like that, uh, you get, I'm here for that as a resource for that. So please do lean on me. Um, feel free to email me. You all have my contact information. And uh, uh, my part of this project is to help you guys succeed in, in communicating. So any questions you might have, you know, if you want me to, to take a look at blog posts or critique images or anything like that as you go along, uh, please let me know. And that's all I have. I am done early, as promised. So I think I'm next. This is Max. I think I'm up next. Uh, I guess I'll just see if anyone has any questions for Chris before I get started. Uh, raise your hand and I'll turn off my mic if you do. If not, um, I'll just reiterate re what Chris requested. If you haven't already sent him a photo, a headshot of yourself, please do that now. As he said, he's heading out for a month and won't be able to manage the site very well while he's gone. And I guess I have one question for him. Would it be possible for somebody else like Andy or you know some other person to do some of that stuff in your absence, Chris, if there's something that has to be done on the website? Yeah. <laughs> It would probably be easier for me to do it than to explain it. It's a couple of different things. But um, I will have internet in uh, in probably in Alulasat and in Iceland uh, sporadically. Okay, so we'll try to keep it to a minimum, but we'll know you're there if we absolutely need you. All right, so I'll get started on my part, and I'll try to be quite brief. Um, the talks that will follow me will be um, sort of more specific science talks talking about specific scientific ideas that some of the students might want to follow up on. But what I'm going to talk about briefly are some of the things that we call overarching activities. Um, these slides got jockeyed around a little bit, so I've got to skip to Chris's. So the, the, these three overarching activities that we have, these are things that go happen from year to year to year every year, I guess. Um, I, we call them the aquatic survey, the terrestrial survey, and the biodiversity survey. I'll mainly talk about the first one, the aquatic survey, but I'll um, give a little bit of background, I guess, on all of these things. Um, as I said, these overarching activities, they extend across years. Um, they uh, sort of provide a baseline of data that um, are important for many of the projects that students do. Um, they can also be the core data that for some of the student projects. But in most cases, um, students will have their own separate sort of independent projects, but um, at least they'll tap into the data stream coming from these overarching activities. Uh, another aspect of this, I think, is that um, one of the, I hope one of the really important legacies, I hope there will be many, but one of, one of the important legacies of the Polaris project, project will be these data that we're producing, both from the student projects, but certainly also from these overarching activities where we're um, building on this uh, data set year after year after year, perhaps seeing changes, certainly um, documenting variability across years, across space, and, and so on. Um, this is a slide that 
I've shown in one of these earlier webinars, and uh, I'm not sure if it's on the website or not, but um, some of the major goals of the Polaris Project, and I think these overarching activities that we're talking about now at least uh, tap into a few of them. And I've highlighted, I guess, three here, um, certainly the contributing to long-term data sets. This is both for the Polaris Project and the participants in the Polaris Project, but also to the wider scientific community. We want these data to be available to whoever wants to use them. That can be scientists around the world. That can be students, teachers, whatever. Um, uh, advancing Arctic science also is one of our main objectives here, and um, these data can be a, the, the basis for that. And finally, sort of the training or developing uh, the next generation of Arctic researchers. Um, participation in this collection of long-term data, I think, is a key aspect of that, as well as um, you know, the sort of consideration of data policies and so on. And we go, I think we go out of our way to try to make the data available, um, to, to share these data with whoever's interested. And I think that's a really important thing for Arctic researchers to do more generally. Okay, so a few words about the aquatic survey. Again, this is one of the three. I'll just briefly, again, mention the there's also the terrestrial survey and the biodiversity survey. We really haven't done much with the biodiversity survey yet. We probably don't, won't do too much um, this year either. So it's the, uh, the it's aquatic survey and terrestrial survey are the, the big ones that will be going on in the field, the big overarching activities. Uh, the map that you see here, the dots on the map are locations that we sampled. I think this might have been in 2009. I, I don't remember right now. And we probably sampled more than that last year. So we cover a, a pretty big range of, of this part of the northeast corner of Siberia, the, the rivers, the highway. We had up and down the river sampling, um, well, for the aquatic survey, aquatic environments all up and down the river and up the tributaries and so on. So uh, this is a shot that we just took earlier today. Uh, it's Paul Mann on the left, uh, Bill Stobzak in the middle, Yarin Vonk on the right. Um, and this is the spreadsheet that I sent all of you, I think, it, I don't know if it was this morning or yesterday morning. And what you can see we printed it out poster size. We'll have this in Chersky with us or an updated version. And all the empty cells on the sort of the lower third of this will be um, filling in with data that we're collecting while we're there. And really have to, the data that are on this spreadsheet are all from 2011 and we'll just sort of continue on with the 2012 data. And it's this really rich uh, data set that's being generated. We also have data from earlier years of the Players Project, 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, and we're sort of in the process of trying to harmonize. We did things a little bit differently in those years, so we're going to try to uh, work on making it so that we can get those older data into the same format. And just this is just my last slide. Um, this holds for everything we do in the Players Project, but I guess even particularly so for these sort of overarching activities, that the quality of the data is incredibly important. We want to be able to compare from year to year. We want to be able to do that again just for the participants in the Players Project, but we also want to be able to want it so that somebody can use this data 50 years from now to look back how this part of the Arctic has changed. So we, we really emphasize the quality of the data here. And that's all I have. I, I'll just pause for a second and people can raise their hand if they have any questions or comments. And if not, I'll get out of the way. And I think it's, it's Mike Coe who's next. Hello, everyone. Uh, Mike Coe at the Whistle Research Center. Okay. So I like to use uh, computer models to simulate the Earth system, the cycling of water, carbon, and energy throughout the system. Um, and those computer models are things like global climate models, land surface models, and river models. Um, the part that really interests me is the land surface. The land surface is, is fun because um, Basically, what it does is it takes incoming solar, uh, incoming radiation. Can you see this? Ever? No, no, no. There's another flight in the somehow. I'm not sure. Never mind. <laughs> it takes incoming ra radiation and water and transfers it into um, vegetation, into carbon, into uh, outgoing long wave radiation and outgoing latent heat flux. So what it does is it it, uh, it mediates the between these these incoming fluxes and outgoing. Um, so. 
what's fun about that is if you change any one thing in the system, you know, the whole thing, the whole system is connected. The, the radiation, the carbon, and the water are all really one system. If you change any one thing, you change all of them. So, for example, if you increase greenhouse gases, you change the downward long wave radiation. That changes the temperature of the surface. It changes how photosynthesis occurs. It changes the CO2 uptake, the water respiration, the water transpiration. Uh, and as a result, you can change the vegetation structure and functioning all by <coughs> just changing one item. And we develop models to try to represent that system. The idea of a model is to simplify the system, but not make it too simple. Um, and the basic function is, the basic way you do that is you, you represent the land surface as a bunch of individual boxes. And in each box, you have some characteristics of the landscape, the soil, the topography, the climate, the pattern of the rivers in it, um, as much information as you can get. And in return, what you get then are representations, simulations of the vegetation, the photosynthetic activity, the soil content of ice and water, runoff and discharge, and a host of, of any other kind of variables you can think of to describe what the land surface is. Um, what makes the Arctic interesting to me, well, I, first I should, you know, full disclosure, I've uh, been working in the Amazon for 12 years, so I have really very little knowledge of the Arctic. <laughs> <laughs> but what makes it interesting is uh, there are big changes going on there. Um, temperatures increasing, that's going to affect the surface vegetation through temperature changes, through permafrost depth changes. Um, CO2 is increasing, that is going to affect the rate at which photosynthesis occurs and the efficiency at which it's occurring. That can change the vegetation structures. That can impact, again, subsurface qualities. Um, rainfall is probably changing. That alters the energy balance and the water balance directly by providing more or less water to the plants to transpire. Uh, it changes what passes through the soil column and what gets mobilized from the soil, say the, the carbon in the soil. And models can really help us address those issues because we can construct a system and we can change one piece at a time and try to understand how each piece affects the system. Um, so we can ask questions like with increasing temperature, how does vegetation, uh, soil and permafrost respond or uh, how important are rainfall and snowfall changes in timing and amount to the system or um, where is the carbon going? So, you know, the plants are, are sequestering carbon in their, in their structure and in the soil, and there's a lot of old carbon in the soil. Where is it going? Is it being mobilized differently with changes in temperature? And the data that we collect up there is really important to these models. Um, and pretty much all data we collect up there is important, whether it's uh, depths of permafrost or what type of the vegetation structure, how tall it is, how wide it is, all kinds of things like that. Um, so I'm really interested in just going up there, seeing what the landscape looks like, seeing what data is being collected, um, perhaps suggesting other things we could collect that would help me get a better handle on uh, how to model the system. And I really like support doing it. Thanks. Yes, I'll just make one comment. One thing that we've been missing so far in the Polaris project is a model to help us put this whole thing together and figure, help us also figure out where the big gaps are. So I'm excited that Mike's going to be there. He's going to be there for a shorter time, I think for the first two weeks. but. One thing that he is working on now, or along with Karen Fry and Dave Mayer at uh, Clark University, is trying to get some uh, rough version of this model up and running before we all arrive in Chersky. So we can start playing some games with, I guess you put, most of you have probably read about some of the Pleistocene Park stuff. And um, you can play a game in a model like, okay, what happens if you get rid of all the, the trees? What does that do to permafrost temperature? How does that feed back to the carbon cycle? So it's a really neat tool that we haven't really had in our arsenal yet that we're um, making strides, we will be making some big strides in developing. All right, let's go to the next one. Go ahead, Paul Mayer. Yeah. This is a swapping event here. Okay. So, so hi guys. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Mann. So I'm a postdoc at the Woods Hole Research Center. Uh, working closely with Max, uh, Rob Spencer, and Kate, that you'll get familiar with even more later. Um, so as, a, as an aquatic chemist, so um, I've spent a little bit of time in the Arctic, and um, I love it as a place to work. So you guys are in for a treat. And, and when we when we think about the Arctic, I think it's, uh, a really good place to start is you know why are we going there? And I think the first thing that always pops to my head is that the, the, the Arctic has huge stocks of carbon. 
And unlike the Amazon, which Mike uh, alluded to earlier, th those uh, carbon stocks are not really in the trees, as you can see. Uh, at the top there, pretty, pretty small things. There's not a lot of carbon, basically, in any of the vegetation uh, above compared to the carbon stocks below ground. So there's a, there's a picture here. This is um, a site that you'll hopefully become uh, very familiar with. This is uh, Devani Yar. Um, the, the river in the foreground is, is the Kolima River, the, 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 the large river that you'll be um, working a lot on if, uh, and you'll, you'll see and you'll live on the barge just on a tributary from this. And this is a fantastic place to work because it's, it's, it's this exposure. So you can, see, um, you can see the soils and you can see just how deep those soils are. And they, they um, lock up vast amounts. So if you think globally, um, the amount of carbon in soil is around uh, 3,000 petagrams of carbon, uh, which is around 3,000 billion grams of carbon, I think. Um, uh, more than half of that is in, the, in permafrost in, in northern latitudes. So it's, it's really important that we get a feel for what's going on with these, um, these uh, very vulnerable carbon pools. Um, and the Arctic, of course, as, as most of you should know, is, is warming faster than anywhere else on the planet. So <clears throat> I'm going to just show one project that we did last year to have a look at this uh, carbon and what happens as it gets mobilized into the streams and the, and the large river. Uh, but we have many other projects, so these are just ideas. So the Vanilla, uh, the, this huge area of soil that you just saw, has these really small streams that, that, go, that, that, uh, that slide down these mud streams. They're quite small. And you can see this, so you imagine the Vanilla is behind you. The water is draining down through the soils um, and into the Kolomo River here, that you can see. So it's a wonderful place to look at what's happening as, as uh, carbon is moving from this, this um, permafrost exposure into uh, the river. And we had two main questions that we wanted to ask. This is a picture of one of those small streams. And we wanted to know how old the carbon was uh, that's dissolved in, in this water. And then after that, we wanted to know how um, available this um, carbon was to uh, bacterial uh, mineralization. So obviously, it's, it's uh, interesting to see where carbon is going. But it's even more interesting if that carbon is being uh, mineralized. So if the bacteria are actually able to feed if, uh, upon that material um, and respire that as greenhouse gases, um, primarily CO2. So these are some findings that we got from last year um, working on Devania. So the Coloma River, that large river that you saw, the age of the carbon in there was around 50 to 100 years before present. But um, amazingly, the, the carbon in these really small streams coming out was um, between 19,350 to 29,400 years before present. So extremely, extremely old carbon, um, and far older than than is really in most of the literature, um, certainly from pristine sites. Um, and somewhat even more surprisingly, uh, this carbon was incredibly biolabile, or tasty, or, or whatever you want to say. So the, the bacteria really uh, could process this material very, very well. So you can see this graph here on the, on the y-axis. You've got DOC loss. So this is the uh, percent loss of carbon that we saw in just 14 days. And we can measure carbon at the, uh, at the station quite easily. And on the left-hand side, you see margin. So that's the column, and that's the, the, the carbon that's in the main river. And in the far right-hand side, what, what we've got here is Yedema, is those small streams that came down. And all I want you to see here is that you can see that on the, on the right hand side, the old carbon that, that was around 22,000 years old uh, disappears quickly, which means you know, that the bacteria are able to chew it and, um, and, and res probably respire that as CO2, almost mm -hmm. certainly, in fact. So that's what um, one of the projects is that I'd quite like to continue. We need to try and explain why uh, this carbon is quite so. Um, tasty, if you like, uh, and why is it more reactive? So there's a whole range of things um, that we can think of that, that are possible uh, questions. You know, uh, is it something to do with the size of the carbon? 
Um, is it something to do with uh, nutrient availability? Um, or is the microbial community different between them? Um, we're, we're not sure, so this is something that um, we'd be very keen to continue uh, this year. Uh, and to do that, there's, as I said uh, before, there's a whole host of uh, techniques. Uh, in the top left, you see these sort of really colorful bottles. That's um, uh, a technique that we use to measure changes in oxygen, which give us an idea of uh, how much the bacteria can use the material, uh, the carbon, how tasty it is, if you like. And the top right is the um, analyzer we use for measuring carbon. And this uh, sort of cobbled together piece of uh, kit here is how we can measure sort of CO2 changes. So you can do incubations like that. And it would it effectively, if you wanted to do this project, it would be a lot of balancing on logs in quite muddy areas. I think that's John in the top there, uh, just about staying on the log. And uh, on the bottom here, I wanted to show this purely uh, to make fun of John. Uh, and he was, uh, he's got his button on, but he's also trying to thaw some ice wedge. So I love that, uh, that picture. But yeah, th there you go. So that's just a snapshot of uh, one of the projects we did this year. So I think I should, should open it up to questions, maybe. Uh, I'll put your hand up if you've got any questions. I know John is not really that fat. Ah, uh, Luke has got a question. Okay. I'll just turn off my mic, and I think John may give you privileges to talk, please. Really. Or just type. Well, you can just type it in if it's a simple question. Luda, I think you can talk if you push your talk button. Oh, is it working? Um, I just had a quick question, Paul. Uh, you mentioned that one possible explanation you were looking at is changes in the microbial community. Is there going to be any means to do that while we're there this year, or was that just something you threw out there? Yeah, really good question. So um, uh, some things uh, with this project we um, would be able to do there. So. One way to get at that is to actually mix uh, samples from different places uh, in with the water. But then to actually do that um, correctly, um, we, we would also take samples and bring them back and analyze them and, and get that done um, at the lab here. So we would do a mixture of work in the field um, and also bring back some samples in order to, to test that. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, just a little more detail on that. The, mm -hmm. We will be, I guess, for the aquatic survey, I think this is in the works now, all the places we sample for the aquatic survey will be bringing back samples for uh, basically microbial yeah. community analysis. We work with a guy in Maryland, his name is Byron Crump, so yeah. he'll do some fancy, fancy techniques to be able to determine what the microbial community is and how it varies spatially yeah. uh, throughout all these places we'll be sampling. We've got a question from uh, Miles. I'll just turn the mic off. Um, will there be any opportunity for us to help with the sample analysis after we return from Russia? Yeah, definitely. And that'll kind of be on a, it'll, it'll work differently for different people in different places. So the, many of the students are at sort of the, the partner institutions where a co-PI is a faculty member. And in that case, it's easy if, if well, if the project relates to something that the uh, co-PI is also involved in. Um, but for the students who are uh, at large from, from, the, from different places, um, We'll work hard with you to figure out ways that you can, uh, we, we want you to remain involved. And whether that's visiting faculty members at various places, whether it's doing some of the analysis at your own institution, and some, we'll work hard to keep you involved. And uh, yeah, so we'll just, we'll continue that conversation, but we'll find a way. Good question. Okay, so uh, I think we should move on to the next. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, I guess I press the button here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah just uh, my name is Jorin Funk. I would probably respond to any kind of uh, pronunciation you have. <laughs> um, because, uh, yeah, it's usually that's not a common here in the States. So I haven't been uh, at any of the um, previous talks because I'm based in Switzerland and it's a bit late there. But now I'm here for a week, so I can join the crowd here and talk a bit more uh, about one project that I'm planning to uh, lead or help out on. Uh, so I'm a postdoc actually, and uh, um, I uh, work mostly on science, but then uh, I use a lot of from fancy techniques and with isotopes, radiocarbon, and other uh, molecular techniques to simple but very efficient uh, techniques that can also be interesting. So, uh, and actually this picture is taken on a lake close to the station, Shuchi Lake, um, which is a nice place to work on once you get the, the, the little boat out there through the forest. Uh, but I will come to that later. So one, I think, at least I hope, most people last week heard, was it last week? Yeah, Bill talk about um, this idea about uh, the passive versus the active uh, pipe uh, system. So if you look at all the inland waters, like lakes and rivers, um, mostly, uh, the, the image below is actually the, what we now currently think is um, more representative. So if you, all the carbon that goes from land to ocean is not just passively transported through lakes and rivers, it is, it is actually processed on its way. And so part of us will be focusing on the um, carbon dioxide, like respiration, invasion, and, 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 and processes in rivers. But what I would like to try to uh, yeah, get to this year is focus on lake sediments and see how much they actually store. Uh, and this is just a slightly more fancy picture where you can see more processes going on from a, a paper by Lars Kranovic. And here you see actually sedimentation rates into the sediment storage, but also uh, just as if there's processing going on in, in, in lakes and streams, in, 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 I mean in rivers and streams, but also in the sediment, of course. Uh, yes, so this is an image actually not from the Colima region, from, but from the Mackenzie River Delta, which also contains massive amounts of lakes. And this is during the freshet. So here you can see still some of the lakes are ice covered, but most of the other ones are all similar in color than the river channels. So they get flooded during that short time of the year. And when the lake, when the river levels go down again, some of them are not connected to the river anymore. But still, I mean, there's quite a lot of deposition of sediment in these lakes that ends up there every year. And you can use that as an, as an archive to go back in time if you core the sediments. But that, I think, from this um, summer might not be feasible. But still, it's a large sink for organic carbon. And you can actually say something more on uh, uh, like a longer time, st time scales, and still we really need more information on this. It's not that well studied. Keep on pressing the keyboard. Okay, here. So um, you've all seen this picture, of course. So the first thing you notice on the on the large satellite image on the right is that there are many lakes out there, and they have different shapes. So you could roughly say that you can divide them in floodplain lakes. Uh, which are connected to the river, or at least part of the year, or they used to be connected. They are uh, quite shallow. Um, and, and the other types of lakes are thermocarst lakes, which form uh, from permafrost that falls, so the ground collapses. And usually those lakes are not connected to the river, or, e or they sometimes not even have an inflow of any water or outflow. And so these, these uh, floodplain lakes, they are um, well, they generally store modern carbon that is delivered by rivers, and of course, they have a lot of production in the summer by uh, uh, plankton and everything that is also ending up in the in the sediments. But the thermocarst lakes generally probably store older or ancient carbon because they get carbon from uh, the, the banks 
that uh, collapse and end up uh, at the bottom. So in this lake survey of the se sediments, it's important to actually focus on both these lake types. And I hope we can get access to both of them. So basically, the idea would be that you will be part of the aquatic survey, which uh, includes a lot of uh, boating around on uh, with Max or some other drivers. Here you actually see that, yeah, if you could picture of somebody with a bug net, but uh, it's anyway, it gives a, a nice image of um, what it would be about. And uh, I will bring a very small, you can't see the scale here, but the, the Van, Van Bain crab sampler, which is a very cute little sampler, as our technician back in Switzerland calls it. Uh, so you can almost have it in your handbag. You can just bring it on these trips, attach your rope to it. Uh, it kind of, it, it, it opens up and it, you, 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 uh, you lock it somehow and as soon as it hits the water bottom, it closes and you can drag up the mud and collect it. And at the station, we actually, there is a muffle furnace that goes up to very high temperatures. So it's a very simple technique that you can uh, measure the amount of any carbon. So it would be very nice if we can do that for quite a lot of lakes, uh, which we will anyway hope to visit with the aquatic survey. And then uh, once you have at least the surface organic carbon contents of most of these lakes, you can actually try to scale it up using these uh, satellite um, images. And as I understood, we have quite some people that know things about remote sensing. So it would be the ultimate combination. And one uh, last idea, which I don't know if it's feasible, but it would be cool. Something that you usually do in the ocean uh, is install sediment traps. So th that's kind of like a vertical cylinder or tube or bottle that you hang out um, in a lake or in, or in the ocean, and it will catch particles that are slowly sinking. So you can calculate the transport of organic matter uh, that will eventually end up in the sediments. So you can you can create something like that and let it hang there for a week or a day, or if it works, we can test it there and leave it over the winter. Um, and yeah, you can, we can order these things, but they are quite expensive. I think it, it should be fairly easy to actually just attach ropes to a weight, which you then let, um, you let it sink to the bottom, and you kind of calculate the, the lake depth, attach, you know, even a, a cut open, uh, water bubble in the middle and some floating device which um, well we need to fit it around with this but um, that might be very nice because as far as I know that has, has never been done uh, before and I think that might be it there you go. yes okay uh, any questions mm -hmm. questions okay I guess not. Oh. You are looking uh, at what does that mean? Means that you the, the sound is going. All right. Oh, a few people have said the sound. Well, I'm done anyway, so I need to work. The mic who can speak up then. Try logging in and logging out and logging back in again. That's what. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hello there. How are you this evening? <laughs> yeah. All right. Hi. How's it going? I'm uh, I'm Mike Laranti, and uh, I'm gonna. Uh, take you up on land. Um, we're going to move away from the water now. Um, I, uh, so yeah, I'm, a, I'm a postdoc here at uh, the Woods Hole Research Center. I've been here since uh, January of 2009 and uh, I'll be um, leaving while we're, uh, while we're in Siberia officially and moving to Colgate. So we'll have a, some sort of little, little event and all the, the uh, Woods Hole people will be very sad. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, seriously. So, um, I do. Um, I, I, I'm. I have very similar interests uh, to uh, what my co-described to you. So, I'm. I'm interested in how uh, how uh, 
uh, matter and energy. So matter, when I say matter, I'm talking about water and carbon and energy, is uh, simply energy and incoming radiation, how that uh, is exchanged between the biosphere and the atmosphere. Um, but unlike Mike, so I, I work at a slightly smaller scale, so I, I work inside of, uh, of one of his grid cells, basically, and I'm interested in, you know, kind of variability within those grid cells, so it's a uh, it's, I think it's a, a logical complement, um, and uh, I'm excited to have him along. Um, so one of the first things uh, that uh, I'll describe is some stuff that uh, that we actually started um, uh, in 2010. So I was in Cherisky two years ago, and uh, um, some stuff that we did uh, there um, two years ago. And so we're asking questions about how fire-mediated vegetation dynamics affect permafrost. Um, and the, the first part of that question is kind of just understanding how fire affects vegetation dynamics. And I really like this picture. So this is a picture um, from actually two sites that we sampled. So what you're looking at is kind of a, um, you know, there's a, there was a fire um, burning outside of town. And so on the right-hand side of your screen, that area is all burned. And down the center is basically a bulldozer track. So they, uh, somebody from town brought a bulldozer out and they kind of, you know, dozed the path straight through um, you know, the forest um, to stop the fire. And so this happened, I think, in, uh, in, the, in the 1980s or 1990s. So you can see that 20 years after the fire, um, the, the, the surface looks very different. So there's very little vegetation recovery. Um, and even the understory, so the shrubs, um, you know, kind of we, you know, we think of trees as the kind of the dominant vegetation form. But looking at the shrubs there, you can see that the surface is lighter. Um, and so that's going to affect, um, you know, kind of how, how snow lays on the surface. It's going to affect how, um, you know, how much uh, energy is absorbed by the surface, um, how, the, how soil water is used. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to impact a lot of those things that, that Mike described. And this is a consequence of, of fire. Um, and so, you know, you kind of think of the whole landscape as a mosaic or a patchwork of, um, of you know, kind of uh, fire scars of different age and, and uh, you have vegetation communities that consequently um, that, that vary quite a lot and then that affects uh, these, uh, the carbon, water, and energy fluxes. Um, so that's kind of, uh, uh, I guess, a, a little background to, to the sort of things I'm interested in. So kind of to get at this first, uh, this first question, how do fire-mediated vegetation dynamics affect permafrost? And so what I'm looking to do is um, use electrical me resistivity measurements to, uh, to monitor or understand soil permafrost conditions. Um, and so this is kind of uh, some work that I started last summer um, in the Alaskan Arctic. Um, kind of new stuff and it's basically using a, a, a giant set of electrodes to inject electric current into the soil um, and you can kind of create these profiles. So that's what you're looking at on the left um, <coughs> that describe the electrical resistivity of the soil and that's very strongly uh, or tightly coupled with uh, I think moisture primarily and also the, the state of that moisture. So whether it's frozen solid or uh, in a liquid phase. Um, and also temperature. Um, and so the idea um, is to kind of use these types of measurements to characterize um, the variability in, uh, in kind of, uh, soil water content, um, in active layer dynamics, um, and, and things of that sort. And so this cartoon is just saying uh, um, it's, this, this is from a site that had an experimental manipulation. Um, and you can see the, the, these folks from the University of Florida who will uh, also be with us this summer, Sue Natale, used a, basically you made a snow drift um, and that deep snow insulated the soil and it thawed some permafrost and so you can kind of see um, beneath that snow drip you see kind of a, a big blue patch, especially in the top image. And so that's wetter and that's a deeper thaw. Um, and so we can kind of, instead of looking at this with point measurements, we can look in kind of a two-dimensional or even a three-dimensional way um, with these measurements. Okay, and so kind of uh, thinking a little bit more about this and in, in the kind of uh, fire-related uh, context, um, you know, we, we can, one place we can do this kind of is in, in large forests and look across gradients. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see a, a really high resolution uh, satellite image from the Cherisky area, and that just shows kind of the, the variability in forest density. Um, and so you can see some really kind of dense 
forest, uh, kind of tightly spaced trees, um, and dark patches there, and then some really sparse forests. And, and so you can actually see individual trees in that image. And so one of the questions I'm interested in, you know, you can kind of think of these uh, these dark and light surfaces in terms of energy absorption. Are they are, are they going to be kind of dark and absorbing energy and transferring into that into the soil, or are they going to be um, kind of shading the soil in the summertime and keeping it cooler? And will all that energy be dissipated kind of through transpiration? So is it going to be used up evaporating water, and it'll never reach it reach the permafrost? Um, so that's that's one sort of question, um, and hoping to uh, answer similar questions uh, with regard to tundra fires. And so this is uh, the image on the right just shows a, a fire scar. So this is a uh, very very near the Arctic Ocean. So you can see Chersky, uh, the yellow dot, and we're up near the Arctic Ocean. There's a, a tundra fire that burned in the mid 70s. So this would be 30 years old, and you know we can we can go there and we can kind of survey the vegetation uh, and see if how the fire has affected the vegetation communities, and then also use the electrical resistivity measurements to uh, to ask um, you know uh, or kind of yeah understand if uh, if there are changes in in the permafrost in the soil um, conditions. So I think that's that's one potential project uh, in a nutshell. And the second uh, is somewhat related to kind of that energy question. So I, I'm curious, uh, you know, to understand how permafrost thaw may impact transpiration. Um, and so, you know, kind of Mike described this a little bit. Um, and I'm going to kind of zoom in uh, on his cartoon, but you can think of vegetation as kind of a, a pipe between the soil and the atmosphere. And so it's it's basically piping water from the soil to the atmosphere. Um, but the only difference is the, the canopy is uh, essentially a valve, and it responds to environmental drivers. So if the soil's too dry, uh, the vegetation can essentially kind of close up and limit water flow. Um, and same with the atmosphere, if the atmosphere is so dry. And so one of the things about these ecosystems is they're, you know, they're underlain by ice, so it's essentially a perched water table. Um, you don't need a lot of precipitation to supply enough moisture for the vegetation because it, it can't, you know, it, it can't infiltrate down through the ground. Uh, it, it can leave laterally, and there's a very shallow soil column. So what happens if, you know, the, the depth of your soil column doubles, um, but your your moisture input um, stays the same, then you, know, you effectively have half as much water for the same vegetation. And so that's, that's something I'm interested in with regard to permafrost thaw. And so how I'm hoping to answer this question is with, with sap flux measurements. So this is essentially inserting two, uh, two uh, temperature probes into a tree. One is heated and one is a reference. And the, kind of the difference between those will be proportional to how fast water is flowing through the stem. Um, and that can, you can basically kind of back out water flow from that. Um, and then I'm hoping to set up an experimental uh, warming um, site that I can actually thaw permafrost out from underneath vegetation. Um, so that, you know, that, that's, uh, I think, maybe a, a lofty goal, but it's possible. And so why not? Um, <laughs> right? Hey, you know, go big or go home. Um, so I've got some. I've got a hundred feet of snow fence that we're going to stick in Scott Zolkos's luggage over here, or maybe <laughs> Logan. I don't know. Some somebody will carry it. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a picture from uh, Sue Natalie's site in uh, in uh, outside of Denali National Park uh, on the bottom there. And so you can see that they've they've uh, created a big snow drift and they're shoveling it off in the spring, uh, so there's no extra moisture. But uh, my my idealistic hope is to. Uh, do this on a hill slope so all the water just runs off and then we don't have to worry about shoveling because <laughs> shoveling is shoveling, no fun. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a little harder to get to and we're not there for as long so we have to improvise. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if that falls through, we can still um, answer some interesting scientific questions just by measuring transpiration in trees, uh, maybe in stands of different densities and things like that. And I think yeah, I think that's that. So uh, I'd be I'd be happy to entertain questions or not. Yes.
Okay, um, Alexander, I'll, I'll talk my mic or turn my mic off so you can ask. Okay, hello, I'm Alexander Holoda from University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, I'm really new in Polaris community. So what I'm going to do uh, in Chersky this year to install some... Uh, so first of all, I'm going to drill boreholes uh, for you guys, for sampling and for everything. But as well, I'm going to install some uh, temperature sensors and soil motion sensors. So I just want to say, so we have to coordinate our works because it could be interesting for both of us how uh, vegetation can influence permafrost and how uh, permafrost changes can influence uh, vegetation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alexander. That's that's great. Uh, I'll, I'll have I'll have some. We should definitely coordinate measurements um, and kind of get the most. I think Max Max is going to chime in here. Yeah, I was just going to say I think we're John can add more to this, but I think we're going to do at least more one more week of these sort of speed dating things, and we should make sure that well, several people, in, 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 including Sasha Holodoff, yeah. Um, Participates and gives a you know a ten minute speed. Yeah. We want to get as kind of broad a perspective as many things that are going on as possible, so that we can link up as much as possible. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for that comment. Yes. And that is, I'll just say one more comment about that. I think reiterate what Sasha or Alexander said that this will be the first year as part of the Polaris project that we've actually drilled into the permafrost. So we're going to be getting, you know, we, we've done very surface, superficial sampling of the soil, but it's, it's deep stuff, as you've heard about, and we'll be getting, um, I guess, at least some 10 meter cores and maybe one deeper than that, and probably a bunch of sort of one meter cores. So we're going to learn a lot more about um, the carbon and the permafrost this year than we have in the past. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> He's not lying. <laughs> drill, baby, drill. Any yeah. All right. John Shade has a question. Good stuff. Great. Right. Actually, that was my way of, of stopping the uh, rambling that I could feel was about to start in the room over there. And I, so I think we're we're about done. Um, unless uh, one of the one of the woods people wants to make another last comment, if so, just raise your hand in that room. But otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap this up. Um, I think we've actually uh, witnessed a miracle. Uh, do we have another question? Uh, Janice said that Mark has a question. So uh, Mark, do you have a question? I'm going to turn my mic off and let you speak. Yeah, I was curious. Um, will the rate of the root growth of the forest be affected by that layer that's melting, um, by the, you know, that greater size? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's 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 Maybe you turn your mic off. <laughs> yeah, OK. So yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think the, the answer is uh, yes, anecdotally. Uh, I'm not sure how much. Um, some folks that I've talked to doing similar work in Alaska say that most of the action is in, you know, kind of the top 30 centimeters of the soil layer, so um, it's uh, it's probably not huge. Um, so we are hoping to make some measurements uh, to get at that question, um, but they're uh, they're tricky to do. It involves either a, a tube and a, an expensive camera and lots of time, or uh, lots of labor with kind of uh, experimental ingrowth. So you put cores down into the soil and measure the rate of, of root growth. Um, so um, the the answer is yes, probably, and uh, um, we're, we'll hope to measure that at some point, um, but probably not this year. Okay, great. Um, if there are there any more questions, if so, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, but I'm going to start wrapping this up. Um, I think, as I was saying, I think we witnessed a miracle. We had five scientists or six scientists from Woods Hole Research Center, and we stayed on time. And no one would have ever thought that was possible. Uh, so good job, speakers, for uh, keeping things brief. Um, I hope uh, the students, if you have any questions for any of these people, you should send them emails. Um, and we're going to do this again next week. Uh, the lineup is yet to be determined. Uh, but I will send an email out to everyone letting you know who is going to be speaking to you. Uh, but again, it's, as usual, it's going to be at the same time. Um, 
So just be here at 7 p.m. Eastern Time next Thursday. And then the week after, and Janet, this is also for you, uh, the week after we're hoping to do a public presentation. Andy Bunn is going to talk about uh, climate change and carbon cycling. Um, and we're going to open it up to the public. So uh, be, there's nothing you guys have to do to prepare for that. Just know that that's going to happen in two weeks. So again, thanks, everybody. Um, and I uh, am going to sign off now, and I will see you guys uh, next week. If anyone else has a comment, uh, please feel free to chime in.